moment as soon as we finish the service, we would greatly appreciate it. So if you will, turn in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 2. Psalms chapter 2. It's a really, really neat psalm that we'll be reading this morning. The first part of it talks about the depravity of man. And then we see God's response uh, to man. And then we see man's response to God. And we see how God presents his mercy that we may know him and have an eternal relationship with him. So if you will, turn to Psalms chapter 2, and we'll read and pray through it. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. This is God's response. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. He shall speak to them in his wrath and address them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have taken you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And then we see the mercy of Christ. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son or embrace the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the great, great pleasure and privilege of being sons and daughters of the one true king. Lord, we too lived in our depravity at one time where we thought we knew everything that we need to know and what everything was best for our lives and our eternal destination. But in your grace and in your mercy, you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, to save us. You have brought your spirit near to us to convict us of our sin. You have reached down and rescued us. You have called us out of darkness into light that we may know you as the one true king. Father, we do not worship a, a God of our imagination or the creation of our hands, but we worship the one true creator God who has created all things. Each of us sitting here today, Father, you knit us together in our mother's womb, just as you are knitting many today in their mother's wombs. And Lord, you have brought us forth that we may know you and live for you. Help us to uh, seek your mercy every day and to die to our own silly self-centered ways, our selfish, sinful ways, our pride, our arrogance, where we think we know so much more than you. Lord, help us to kiss the Son. Help us to embrace the Son. Help us to turn to the Son for wisdom and understanding, to look to you for salvation. And so, Father, we do pray for those who are here today who do not know you, that they would know you as our Lord and Savior. And those who are here today who may not know you and are fooled into believing they are saved, Lord, that you would save them as well. And for those of us who are saved, as we get to celebrate in this time of worship with you and in Holy Communion in a little while, Lord, we ask your blessings upon us that we may see you high and lifted up, the one true King who lives and reigns for eternal. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, you got your Bibles open. If you would go ahead and turn to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1. And of course, we come this morning before the Lord to worship and to celebrate the table of His Son as we see the broken bread and the poured out juice from the grapes, both of which point to the awesome fact, saints, that our salvation was not easily achieved. The broken bread... And the grape juice symbolized what Christ Jesus had to do and what he went through in order to deal with our sin, to deal with our rebellion against God, to deal with our spiritual death, that we were once dead to God, 
But now we have been made a life in Christ. We've been made alive in Christ and through Christ. And there's so many words that, that describe this, our salvation, that we have been saved. We've been redeemed. We've been adopted, spiritually reborn. We have been made new creatures in Christ Jesus so that the old is dead and gone. And behold, all things have been made new. And yet we understand that we live in a world where our king doesn't sovereignly reign over the nations and in the hearts and the lives of billions of people. We are surrounded by those who are still enemies of our Lord's righteous rule and who live in constant opposition to him. They oppose his holiness. They oppose his glory. They oppose his majesty and his beauty. They oppose his love and compassion. They oppose his mercy, and his grace. And they most certainly oppose his wrath and his judgment. So that everything that Jesus Christ is for, the unredeemed are against. And therefore, saints, how wonderful it is that we fall into the camp of the redeemed. That we know Christ and we love him because he first knew us and loved us before the foundations of the world were laid. And because we now belong to him, everything that he is for, we are for, and everything that he is against, we are against. And so we live in a world that is in stark opposition to our glorious God and King, the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we long to live in a world where his reign and his rule permeates everything and every human, every human being will fall under his divine sovereign authority. That's what we long for. And saints, that future that we long for the Father will bring to fruition for His Son. This is the future and the destiny of our Lord Jesus. And this is why we cry out, Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And so as we arrive at the end of Hebrews chapter 1, uh, we also arrive at this final statement of why Jesus is superior to angels as seen in this seventh quote from the Old Testament. And again, what we are about to read are the words of the father speaking to the son. And so listen carefully to his word. We'll pick up there in verse 13. The word of God says, Hebrews chapter one, verse 13, and to which of the angels has he, the father, ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? And so here we get this glorious glimpse of the future, both of our holy eternal savior, as well as that of the holy angels. Here we find two final and eternal destinies. We have the destiny of the Son. We have the destiny of angels. And the author of Hebrews will again make this comparison between the two in order to drive home the point that there really is no comparison at all. Jesus is infinitely greater than the angels. And just look at what their final destinies look like. So first I want you to notice the destiny of the Son that his destiny is to sovereignly reign over all, to sovereignly reign over all. Again, looking at verse 13, and to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And so God the Father has spoken to his son, and these words that he has spoken to his son, he has never spoken to any angel. The Father's only speaking of the son and to the son. And he has his eternal inheritance in mind as he says these words. And there are several ways that the father expresses his, son, his son's right to rule over all things. 
And first you notice what the father says to the son when he says, sit, sit at my right hand. And so the son takes his place beside the father. It is by his side. It is by his father's right side, his right hand, which is the side of of strength and honor. It is the side of authority. It is the side of power, of power. This week, for those who have been going through the Behold Your God discipleship series, we've been, we've been filling our hearts and minds with the, this endless, immeasurable, incomprehensible power of God. That is one of the attributes that we have been looking at, his omnipotence, that God is all powerful. And how powerful is he? Well, we really don't know outside of saying that it goes well beyond the scope of our impotent understanding. We have such a limited, tiny understanding of who this God is and the magnificence and the breadth of his power. But I love what was pointed out in the study. And and it's a startling statement that the prophet Habakkuk said, when he was recalling the power of God on display for the Jews at Mount Sinai. In Exodus chapter 19, Moses describes the omnipotence of God in this manner. Listen carefully. He said, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. We're talking millions of people. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. That, my friends, is a frightening, frightening scene. But then Habakkuk describes this very same event in this manner. Habakkuk 3, 4. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand. And there he veiled his power. He describes the mighty power of God at Mount Sinai as veiled or the hiding of his power. Why? Why would the Spirit of God through this prophet describe that event as the veiling of God's power or as the hiding of his power. Well, it is because God's power is so vast and so immeasurable that even when we experience such a fearful demonstration of his power as they did at Mount Sinai, yet what we are seeing is just the fringe of God's power. It's just a mere little glimpse God's power is so great that whatever demonstration he gives us is as if it was hidden or veiled. In other words, it really is too much for us to handle. It is really too much for us to understand. And yet, it is this power and this authority that the Father is rightfully handing over to the son. Over in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11, it says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. As Peter over in 2 Peter 1.3 urges to make our calling and election sure, he states that this same power, saints, is also shared with us. 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power 
has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So saints, we cannot live the Christian life apart from this power. This divine power has been granted to us so that we may live godly lives for God's glory. Now, the question might be, well, how do we lay hold of this power? Of course, the assumption is, is that you're saved and you know Christ. And yet, this power must be laid hold of for a purpose and for a reason. And and it is so that we can grow in Christ. And so Jesus Christ comes along and he says to us, let me inform you how you can continuously tap into this power and walk therein that your lives would be a reflection of Christ, that you may know him and love him and obey him and follow him and glorify him in this life. And so Jesus gives us the answer in John 15, 5. And this is what our Lord says. He said, I am the vine and you guys are the branches. Whoever abides in me, And I in him, he it is that will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you and you and you and you and I can do absolutely nothing. Nothing. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And that power resides in his son. And Jesus says, abide in me. Abide in me that you may bear much fruit. To be with him in his word. And to have his word abiding in your heart and in your mind. To be with him in prayer. And to offer up your your prayers of thanksgiving and and worship and adoration and confession and intercession on behalf of others. Saints, God wants you to fellowship with him. That's a greater honor than we could ever imagine. Do not neglect the resources that he has given us. Do not neglect the living word of God, Jesus Christ. Abide in him and his power will abide in you. And then Jesus says, it is a guarantee you will bear much fruit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit as we obey the word of God, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, lay hold of it. As the father tells the son to sit at my right hand, he is handing over to the son the power and the right to sovereignly rule over everything. I want you to see something very interesting. I want you to turn over to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. Because this handing over of power to the son, it's almost like a process of sorts. And I want you to see this progression of power. Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation, as Jesus is about to display his mighty power through judgment, and he's about to reclaim that which is rightfully his, we notice this progress of power that is being given by the father and being received by the son. And so just before the son receives the scroll, this title deed to the earth, we arrive at Revelation 5, verses 11 and 12. And the word of God says, John is speaking, then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. He's worthy to receive what? Power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. 
He is worthy to receive power, but he hasn't received it yet. Now turn over to Revelation chapter 9, or chapter 19, rather. Revelation 19. And here, after the earth has been judged and all the nations conquered, listen to what this great multitude in heaven exclaims. Revelation 19, 1. After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are true and just, and he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Salvation and glory and power belong to to our God. So first, the Lamb of God is worthy to receive power, but all power and authority now belongs to him in Revelation 19. So that the Father, like a baton, is handing everything over to his Son. So the destiny of the Son is to sovereignly reign over all. And the father expresses his son's right to rule over all things first in saying, sit at my right hand. But next, the father expresses his son's right to rule in saying to the son in verse 13, notice what else he says. He said, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So one day, saints, the father will make his son's enemies a footstool for his feet. Now, what is, what is meant by this? What does the footstool symbolize? I want you to write down a few words so that it is clear in our minds what the Father is doing for the Son. I want you to write down the word submission, the word conquer, the word dominion, and the word rest. The word submission to help us understand the symbolism of this footstool. Submission. That one day, all of Christ's enemies, all human enemies and all spiritual enemies, Satan and all fallen angels, will be under his submission whether they want it or not. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, the son, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Saints, today we sit here and we say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? But there's going to be a group of people a massive throng of billions of people that will one day say the same thing through clenched teeth. Jesus Christ is Lord. They loathe him and they hate him forever, but they cannot deny the reality that the son of God reigns and rules over them. And let me remind you, he also reigns and rules over them in hell. You see, so many times people think that Jesus is, his presence isn't in hell. Yes, it is. Who reigns everywhere at all times? Jesus. He's, he's omnipresent. Satan, Lucifer doesn't reign and rule in hell. He is going to be cast into the lake of fire along with all of those who call him father for all of eternity. And in his presence, there in the presence of Jesus, they will be tormented. Let me tell you something. Think about it like this. What makes hell hell for those who go there? It is the presence of Jesus. That is their greatest torment. Why? Because they live their lives on this earth in such a way 
as if he never existed and they loved it and they want it that way forever. But they cannot escape his presence. From the highest heavens to the lowest depths, they cannot escape the presence of our God and King. And so he will reign and rule over everyone and everything. And he will place them as if they were a footstool under his feet. First word, submission. Second word, conquer. Christ Jesus will conquer and destroy all of his enemies. He will conquer saints until all is conquered. Again, from Revelation 19, we find this, this massive army of men from all the nations, and they're gathering around Israel to make war with Christ and his people, the church. And Jesus comes back to earth riding on a white horse along with all of the angelic armies of heaven. And listen to what it says. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army, this angelic host. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who was in the presence, in its presence, had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain. How? By the angelic army? No. By Christ. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from his mouth, who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds gorged on their flesh. Can you imagine seeing that? We will one day. How is our Lord going to destroy this army? It is as effortless as speaking a word. He speaks and they all fall dead physically. And then the birds of the earth poke away at their flesh, and eat them. Christ will conquer until all is conquered and placed under his feet. Third word, dominion. Dominion. Jesus will one day retake all that has been lost in the fall of creation, all power and authority and control. Psalm 8, 6 says, you have been given dominion over the works of your hands. I don't know if this ever shocks you because oftentimes we, we, we like to think that, that, of course, God has all dominion. We know that. And yet there is something missing from the son that the father is going to give to him. That's why it says you have been given dominion over the works of your hands. Jesus Christ, our glorious creator, is going to be given dominion once again over the works of his hands, as the psalmist continues to say, you have put all things under his feet. I like what Nebuchadnezzar says in Daniel 4.34, when I believe Nebuchadnezzar became a follower of the one true God. He said this, his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the nations all of Christ's enemies will be placed under his feet. Everything will fall under the son's sovereign reign. Submission, conquer, dominion, and then the word rest, rest. He places his feet, as it were, up on this footstool of his enemies. That one day, all of Christ's glorious work of redemption will be finally and completely realized. His enemies will be conquered. Satan and all who follow him will forever be cast in the lake of fire. And the promise of what Paul wrote in Ephesians 1.10 will come to be. And listen to what Paul said. As a plan for the fullness of time, Christ, through his sacrifice, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. He will be at rest and everything in his creation 
will be exactly as it is supposed to be. Everything in his creation will be exactly the way he wants it to be. So please listen. You are either Jesus' friend by conversion, or you will become his footstool by your continued rebellion. You either become his friend by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, or you will forever make yourself his enemy. What say you? Which would you rather be? His friend or his footstool, his enemy? While you still have the breath of life in your lungs, if you don't know him, surrender to him. Surrender to him. Let go of your life and turn it over to his rightful reign over you. So first we notice the destiny of the son. His destiny is to sovereignly reign over all. And in closing, I want you to notice now the destiny of the angels because there's this comparison going on saying that the son is infinitely greater than the angels. Look at the destiny of the angel. I mean, look at the destiny of the son. Now let me show you the destiny of the angels. Here it is. To forever serve you. Can you believe that? The destiny of the angels is to forever serve the saints. Look there at verse 14. He goes on to say, are they angels, not all ministering spirits, sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Sent out to serve those who will inherit salvation. So we who are the heirs of salvation, those who have inherited this priceless, timeless gift because of the finished work of Christ will forever be served by these holy angels. Notice the father refers to them as ministering spirits whom he sends out. He sends them out to do what? What will be the father's eternal purpose for them? To serve those who will inherit salvation. <laughs> Would you stop to think about that? Can we have ever begin, even begin to imagine in eternity, in the eternal state, in the new heavens and the new earth, that these holy angels, the trillions of them, are going to be serving us. Serving us, uh, th these mighty, glorious, powerful spirit beings who in times past, were there at the giving of the law, who conquered and destroyed armies of men, who were there when Daniel was in the lion's den, who ministered to Christ during his days of anguish and suffering, those same angels will be serving forever and ever and ever us. I think one of the greatest, well, one of the most humble acts of serving each other I don't know if you've ever done it before. I have, and it is humbling, is to wash another's feet. You ever done that? You ever wash somebody's feet? I don't know if it's more humbling to receive it or to give it. I think it's more humbling to receive it, don't you? But can you imagine one of these holy angels coming up to you and saying, have a seat. Have a seat. Miss Gail, let me wash your feet. And you'd be going, <laughs> what? You? Uh, you want to wash my, my feet? I, I, don't, I don't know what their service is going to look like. But they're there with us continuously, serving the saints of God, those who will inherit salvation. It is humbling. It, it, it is joyous. Uh, how wonderful eternity is going to be 
So not only will we eternally be in Christ's presence, but we will forever be the recipients of service by these angels. So Jesus' destiny is to sovereignly reign while the angel's destiny is to serve the saints. Why? Because Jesus is infinitely better than the angels. As we close right now, would you bow your heads and would you close your eyes? And I want to close with this. As we continue to prepare our hearts for communion, I know we have several guests with us and we are grateful you are here. And we want you to know that if you name the name of Christ, if you, if you know Christ, we invite you, as we will, to participate with us. But we do ask that if you don't know Christ, you're not sure that you're saved, then this table is not, is not for you. It is only for those who know Christ. And we would ask respectfully that you do not partake. But in preparation, saints, for partaking, I want to read for you a passage from Hebrews 10 that says this. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Saints, we, we look at all that Christ has done to make his enemies his friends. He left heaven for earth. He left his throne and glory and worship to become human, common, and rejected. The Holy One became the cursed one, the one who knew no sin became sin for us, a sin sacrifice. The author of life died an unjust death. And the guiltless one died as if he were as guilty as we are. And yet, and yet, he has such few friends in comparison to those who will forever reject him. And so what is our response to these truths? It's worship. But also like what Matthew Henry wrote. And it becomes his people to be in their duty. Being what he would have them to be. Doing what he would have them to do. Avoiding what he would have them to avoid. Bearing what he would have them bear. Till he make them conquerors and more than conquerors over all their spiritual enemies father in heaven how could we ever thank you enough for your son for his sinless perfect life for his atoning sacrifice stepping into your courtroom in the midst of this throng of people who are guilty taking him upon the death penalty that belonged to us, but you laid it upon him. And you treated him as if he was as guilty as we are, and yet he was without sin, so that your justice would be upheld, and you would be our justifier. Father, as we approach this table, I don't know what this last week has looked like for 
anyone here the last month. But I pray that before we approach, oh God, that you would search our hearts. And you would expose to us, you would reveal to us any sins that we have been hanging on to or giving into, any bitterness or pride or unbelief, lust or hate, whatever it may be, Father, would you bring it to our minds that we may come before you and confess our sins and understand that you were faithful and just to forgive us. Father, we thank you that though we are forever justified through faith in your son, and yet we struggle with sin, that we can come before you at any moment, at any time, to say to you, I'm sorry. That any sin that we commit against you, that we would be so quick to confess it, and repent of it, and receive your forgiveness. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done for us, and for this celebration and remembrance of your Son, of his crucifixion, his atoning sacrifice, that he paid in full, And he exclaimed it when he said, it is finished. Thank you that he appeased your wrath against us. And now we are the objects of your love, your tenderness, your kindness, your compassion. And that out of love, you discipline us when we go astray. Father, thank you for this precious time together with your saints in celebration of you. And so saints, as we approach the table, I'll give you some basic instructions.